Okay, good evening everyone and thank you for attending this Corporate Finance and Performance Scrutiny Panel on Tuesday, Thursday the 1st of February. Um, to be advised that this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel and when you're speaking please remember to switch on your microphone before addressing the meeting and remember to switch it off when you've finished. Um, I'll move on to apologies for absence which I've had from Councillors Jackie Smith, Councillor Jit Ranabat and Councillor John Hills. Is there any urgent business? See none. Are there any declarations of interest for items on the agenda? See none. Thank you. Could members confirm as accurate the minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of October? Well, of course, remember we had to postpone the one post that pending a uh, more substantive report. So the last one we had was on the 4th of September, uh, October. Members happy to agree those? Fine. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. It's very wise, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we'll move swiftly on because I know we've only got Kit for a limited time this evening. So I would ask, once Kit's presented, we have succinct, punchy questions for Kit when we get there to let her get out the door on time. So um, we'll go over to Kit Collingwood for an update on the digital strategy as we are. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, I appreciate it, and I apologise in advance for leaving early. Um, so I'll keep the exhibition really short so you can ask lots of lovely, chunky questions. Um, so this report provides an update of the work completed in the digital team over the last year against the strategy. So I've split it out into the work streams and strategy as I have done at previous um, committee meetings, so hopefully that makes it easier to process. Um, I've also listed out the in-flight work so that you can uh, speak about that if you have questions. Um, and just at the end there, I've given a kind of a hint of what we might be up to over the next year. That is obviously subject to governance, so that can shift. Um, but because of so much of our work now, because we are in year three of the four-year digital strategy, quite a lot of the work is predictable, so I thought it was best to pop that in. I am happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. I have a few, but do members want to go first? That's all right. <laughs> Sorry, should I have spoken longer? <laughs> I should have <laughs> spun that one out of it, shouldn't I? Uh, I'll knock off. Um, so I just want to say, so from, uh, thank you for the report. Um, I just want to say from the, the contact center statistics, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Simon, huge improvement. So, sorry, we're oh. on the digital updates. That's oh, the customer services one. So we'll come on to those. Oh, okay, sorry. Do you want me to jump one in while you get no, caught no, on it? You, yep, I'll jump. So uh, just some points of clarification on the report maybe before we get started. So on 438, the new website, uh, you talk about the first release will be going live in around April, May 2023. Presumably you mean 2024? I do indeed. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> just note that. <laughs> so, um, And then on 4320, uh, the Housing Repairs Transformation Program. Do you have any kind of examples of these things they've been trialling, whether it's been successful, any good news stories around that one, or things that haven't worked out so well? I do. I think it's best that we write to you with that, just to talk about the outcomes of that, because it's held within the service. I'd feel a bit as if I was over-speaking them. But if I write to the panel afterwards and copy housing operational colleagues in, that might be for the best, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. If we could just note that down. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Simon, do you? Oh, Joe. Sorry. Okay. My questions are a little bit scattergun in a way. And I suppose, it, think of it as an exam question where you have to, you, you like answer with one example from your work or from what you've read. Because what I'm looking at is, I think, it's against the strategy, but the purpose of the strategy is sort of much wider than this list, effectively. The list is the steps to, to, to fulfill the strategy, and I, I, I would take it as. And the strategy as a whole, I guess, is about making the council as a whole more efficient, effective, um, saving time, saving money, uh, making it better for staff to work in, 
all those sort of, and, and are more responsive to residents' needs. So we've, we've got the detail of the different sort of goals along the way. I'm just wondering if you can think of anything here where you can sort of give me that more quantitative overall, strategically, how are we really doing against the strategy? What a fab question. Um, yeah, no, I don't think that's scattergun at all. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I suppose one thing I would say is, as you know, because you've been sitting on this committee for some time, we're in year three of four. So this reads like chapter three of a four-chapter novel, doesn't it? So if you, if you didn't know all the characters, it wouldn't necessarily make as much sense. So I could only apologize for the degree of detail in it. I suppose there's, there's a few meaningful things from my point of view. Um, I think the, probably the biggest area of impact has got to be on staff. I think we have to say that. And part of that is because year one of this was 2021. So I think if you were a member of staff here, um, just as I entered the organization four years ago versus now, you'd have a sort of a seismically different working experience. So you wouldn't have been able to work from home with very, very few exceptions. You would not, not have been able to instant message your colleagues, for example. Um, you would have been calling on a hard phone. You couldn't have done that online. Um, you couldn't have collaborated on any documents. You wouldn't have had any cyber training so that's kind of, these are examples where you'll see the detail in the report, but what that adds up to as a staff experience is, you know, I think that's quite profound. Um, but I, th I think let's answer, try and answer the harder question. Underneath that, how on earth would you measure that? You know, I think that's a fair challenge. Um, and what we don't put in these reports is the KPIs that, you know, how do we know that it's um, more efficient? So I'd like to take that on as a challenge and see, you know, if I come back and we think of some metrics on the more strategic level, I think that would be um, really good. So that's the staffing bit. I think impact on residents, um, you know, it's, it'll be different for different groups. So we've made some universal shifts in improving web content. So we can measure how easy it is to get to our housing content, um, our council tax content, some of the navigation around the, you know, we can measure all of that stuff and maybe we should be including that more in here. And then I'd say over the next year, we'll be able to measure those impacts more from the internal service point of view. So the differences we're making in social care housing in particular, and then some other bits and bobs, but they're the two really big kind of impact areas for this coming year. I think you'd be able to measure that, not just from sort of navigability of services, but actual outcome difference. So yeah, I think fair challenge. And because I'm so much in the weeds of chapter three, you know, I think, I think it's fair of you to ask that. And it'd be good to write back with that more strategic view if I could. Great, thank you for that. Um, Simon, did you want to come in on any of these? Or are you all right at the moment? So. I suppose in terms of the strategy, sort of what, what's the, are there any longer term priorities? So one, once we finish the novel? As... Well, I mean, I would say we're not just doing novel stuff. Yeah, so if I, if I talk about the chunky bits then, um, well, actually, let me answer the question in two ways. So this isn't what you meant, but let me say it for the record. The strategy is due to be refreshed in November. So this panel will be looking at a different set of priorities from the next time we meet. Um, and I'd be happy to work with you on the development of that strategy because I think that's really important. But that wasn't the thrust of your question. Um, the, the changes that are described, albeit in a chapter three type way, do impact on the biggest challenge areas for the whole council. So if I name a few of those, supply and demand side for housing. Um, you know, they're areas where we're making a material impact both in the data side and in the product side. Um, SEN transport, you know, one of the biggest cost burners for the organization. Our work is planned to take half a million pounds out of that. Housing repairs is a third, and social care supply and demand. So I think I would say from the, from the point of view of when I had the vision of building this team, this is the kind of work I would have aspired to do. That's the kind of work that we're doing. And, and I hope that you can see that all the way through. And then underpinning that is the deeply unsexy, thankless work that the digital team does, but which I'm really proud of. So cybersecurity protection is keeping the place safe. All of the cloud migration work we've done, not just helps collaboration, but to help keep people safe online. And we're training it out as well. Stuff like the website, you know, so often an overlooked piece of work, but that, the way that that helps residents to get in touch with us in an accessible way is, you know, really profound. And I would just say shout out on the website stuff. 
our website has moved up 100 places. There's an index of local authority websites. We were 179 a year ago, and we're now 78. We've moved up 100 places. And the impact on that for residents and how easy it is to get to us is really massive. So it's that kind of work which, if you're in my team, you know, you really get a heartswell moment. Um, but we can measure the impact of that on residents as well. So I'm, re I'm really proud right across the piece. Yeah, I think that's, that's good too. I mean, one of my, I think we've, as, as we've sort of got to know each other over the last sort of year or so, one of my bugbears is always where people talk about frontline services and the importance of it. And I always think, well, actually, it is important, frontline services, but the kind of the glue that holds everything together is the back office side of things. So it's glad to, to it's, it's heartening for me that you're looking to tackle that because that, that's really where the work gets done in terms of solving residents' issues and, 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 and making their sort of, the, the things that they want from the council happen. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That's really kind. Um, I think it would be hilarious to engage in a front office, back office uh, arm wrestle, but I'll resist doing that. I think technically we represent both either way, so I'd lose and win, uh, whichever. But I think one thing I can strongly agree with you on is that I'm proud of the enabling work that this team does, and I think it's, it's a humble team that works to make the biggest services more effective, and that, um, you know, these, the work that's described in this report is the work of years. So, so we'll, we do do some short-term work, but very little nowadays. That's why I can predict fairly certainly what we'll do next year, because you don't just go into housing repairs and then extract yourself after a year or even 18 months. So, you know, it's, it's work where you dig in um, and it's organizational change. So, the, you know, the digital team is called the digital team, um, but it's an enabling organizational change team. Um, and that's, that's why these long-term programs are so fulfilling, I would say. Thanks for that, that's great. Um, moving on to Workstream 3, the Get Better with Data. Sitting on the main overview and scrutiny panel, as I do, we recently talked about the carbon neutral plan and some of the work they're doing there um, to have data-led decisions. And I just wondered how you crossed over into the carbon neutral plan, because I don't see it as an item here. I know it's a big beast, but there must be expertise, skills about internal data in the organization. How's that feed through? Yeah, th uh, thank you, Chair. That's a great question. Um, it's not, is the blunt answer. Yeah, so we don't work on it at the moment at all. Um, I would say that's for two broad reasons. The, the main reason, though, is that that work in itself is fairly um, new. So some, if you imagine infinite demand for data skills, but finite capacity to, you know, that, that's the way of things. Um, but also, and I'm not an expert in this, but there's quite a mature market for data insights in anything climate related. It's one of the more mature areas. So it's an area where it is sensible in some um, circumstances to buy that expertise in, and even those products in actually. And my understanding is that's some of what's happening. They know that we're always up for working with them. It just hasn't happened yet, basically. Great, thank you, that's good to hear. And uh, yeah, great. Um, you touched on earlier the cybersecurity work and it's great that that work's been done. Um, couple of questions on that and it's kind of tied to the backup because I see that as part of data security as well, really, when we're in there. So firstly, with all this work done, are we seeking any sort of certifications? Have we established them like Cyber Essentials, SOC2, that sort of thing, just to publicly attest how well we're doing with the certification mark? And then in a very broad question and one that you might want to caveat an answer to with the backup type thing, do you, do you think we're now in a situation where we wouldn't be in a London Borough of Hackney type situation with what we've done? Thanks. Oh, wow. Um, okay, I'll do the easy question first. We're not actually working towards any credentials at the moment uh, for no particular reason. So if it's okay, I'll just go and have a little um, think about that. We know that our cybersecurity posture has massively improved even within this year. Um, and as I say, we've had some central government funding to help us do that. Um, I will never sit here and say that we couldn't be Hackney. Um, anybody can be Hackney given the right human effort. Um, and as, as I've described before, the, um, the circumstances that led to that, um, they couldn't happen within the infrastructure that I'm describing here, but the infrastructure I'm describing here does not cover the whole organization. So if I had to say where we are um, most vulnerable, um, it would normally be from human error rather than from our infrastructure, and we've done our level best to clean up that infrastructure, but there's always legacy, and humans are not fallible. So, 
Um, one of the things, I can't remember whether I've mentioned it in this report, but one of the next things we're going to start doing is uh, dry runs for uh, cyber attacks, and then that'll start to really train. It, they're quite scary, but, you know, it, that's the right thing to do. It's better than a real one anyway, so. And, and that was a wonderful segue for me to come on to my next one about human error and the training and the cyber awareness. It's still a bit low for my liking. I see there's been progress, and I know I've got, we'll touch on the actions from the last time we met. Um, there, and that I think it's fair to say previously completed, there's a plan and, and we got the breakdown we wanted, which I'll share with panel members, I only got it earlier, the, uh, the action tracking. But again, I think, so I think firstly a recommendation perhaps coming back to the cybersecurity element that we look at the feasibility of a certification at some point out there in industry, kind of standard accreditation to our level of cybersecurity, uh, if that could be feasible, if we could look at that, that's all we're asking for there. And, and again, with the training numbers, just that, again, a recommendation that we look at ways to drive that up again, because it's still, the dial's not moved enough. And as you say, people are probably the biggest risks now. Yeah, pesky people. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take that first action. Um, because of the complexity of the technology ecosystems that we run in the council, it might be more sensible for me to provide a cybersecurity statement rather than seek accreditation, but I'm not saying that for sure, I'd have to go away and look at it. But because the suppliers themselves have to seek accreditation, to aggregate that might, you know, might not actually give you what you're looking for. But either or, I'm happy to provide that. And then, yeah, so cyber awareness training, it's actually quite a good time to challenge me on this, because we've just changed our supplier. So, if there was ever a time to demand more than 79%, uh, it's probably now. And we're actually just about to do the comms to refresh that, uh, sorry, not to refresh, we're about to do the comms to re-inform people that they need to do this training because you'll get natural attrition. Um, I do hear that 79% is, is awfully good. We're on about 70 across the whole organization, which with the field workers we've got is pretty decent. But, you know, I'm always up for the challenge. And I, like you, I share the view that it's the more the merrier and the more the safer. So, yeah, I'm happy to take that challenge on. Yeah, and, and I'd reflect, you know, it's, I think it's, it's never a finished action, right? It, we've got to keep pushing for it and to get that higher. And I, I agree we'll probably never hit 100%, but we need to get close. I, I think where I struggle is it's always described as mandatory training. And what I would look for is some link up with, you know, human resources, those teams to say, actually, this is part of the job. You know, you, you do health and safety training for working with certain tools. A computer is a tool. Cybersecurity is a tool. You need to be doing this. So I, I think there needs to be some sort of, and I'm happy to make a recommendation around how HR can interact with this to make it a bit more, a management to actually force this to be done. Yeah, no, fair challenge. Yep, I, I, um, I would appreciate that recommendation. Councillor Vandenbroek, sir. Yes, that's good. If we're talking about training, and I'm, I'm now being very simplistic because my training needs to be simplistic, do include the counsellors um, because uh, I, I, I do know that, you know, I hadn't used Outlook for 15 years when I came to this and I'm not using it properly. You know, there's things on there that, you know, really things that, tools that I should be using without thinking about it mean nothing to me. I don't even know where to look for them. I don't know what I don't know. And, and other than going on to... So I, it'd be nice to have... I mean, it, it may be out there for, for staff. I am really talking about level of training to, you know, to best use the common software to its best. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how does that work throughout um, staff is are there assumptions about what people know and don't know because there certainly were assumptions about us as counselors and we come from very very different places i mean simon and nick are both you know both hugely uh, um it savvy i mean it's it's what they do but uh, most of us aren't <laughs> don't know anything about it <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll be as generous as I can in, in my comments. Yeah, so it is, it is mandatory training for members as well. Um, not all members have completed it, despite how mandatory it is. Um, so I do have to tread slightly carefully. That's the cyber awareness. On the wider training, I wonder whether we just need to do a better job of communication, because um, I have two training officers in my team who are available for that, and maybe we just don't publicize um, that enough. So I think... Um, feel free to make a recommendation that we both publicise it and then proactively offer it through member services yeah. for you. Yeah. 
And, and I think there's something very telling there, because once you've said that, I had not realised that members needed to complete that. And I am probably one of the sinners on that basis, having sat here encouraging the number up. <laughs> um, so that's probably type telling in itself, right? So I that's think why that's I was a... treading carefully. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh God, now I feel bad. Right? So <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, I think definitely a recommendation to publicise that training, and also maybe if it is mandatory, I've not been hounded to do it, and I would exp where I have mandatory training in other roles, I am hounded to do it. So I think. I worry that we've done a once and done and we didn't do any mop up. So yeah, um, fair challenge. I think it'd be, um, there's no reason we shouldn't offer refresher training right across the member cohort. Great, thank you. And then one other one I had, which is a bit broader. So you touch on things that's becoming more and more prevalent in 4.333 in the policy and guidance. We touch on artificial intelligence and said we've given guidance. Are there any examples of where we're now using AI to any productivity gain in the organisation? Hmm. Um, it depends what you consider to be AI. I'm trying not to sound evasive. Um, there are, so not corporately, so that, no, but um, AI is effectively built into many technology ecosystems, whether we want it or not. So Copilot in Microsoft is a classic example. So by default, yes, the organization is using it. We just haven't um, uh, built anything. We haven't built a product based on it. So, but you can't avoid it anymore. Copilot comes baked in to um, our entire uh, Microsoft ecosystem. We get it through our licensing. Whether, we, how, whether and how we use it is different. So the, what, what we focused on is not the things which we get out of the box, but the tools which people are most likely to use in a risky way, and ChatGPT is the classic one. And that's why we issued guidance saying you must not put personal data in it. We do encourage people to experiment in safe ways with these technologies because they have such efficiency gains. But it's vital that people don't do case notes, personal information. And although that might seem common sense, um, it has, it's, it's not universal common sense, I would say. So, um, yeah, that's where we've uh, started. I mean, we could talk about the future potential for the kind of spectrum of AI across council, but we'd be, we're here all night. There's nothing that we've built that's a product that bakes it in yet. No, that's great. And I, I think it's far too early to say what efficiencies could be gained, what you know, automation we could achieve with it. But it's interesting to hear that Copilot is baked in, and that's widely deployed to the workforce, is it? I actually don't know. Let me check. Thank you. Um, noting the time, I did want to cover off something just from the next item, though, briefly before you go, to dance around a bit while the, everyone's here. You asked us to um, reconsider a recommendation from the last time we met about on the customer service stuff. So members requested a CRM report on the number of calls per logged case using duplicate number calls as a proxy. So. If memory serves, this was an ask that we could see how many calls had occurred in relation to a specific case. Now the response, which I think is reasonable, is it's not something that's easy to do and would involve a lot of our officer time. So I wondered if members were happy to withdraw that recommendation, that we get that information at this stage, based on that. So. I wonder, what was underneath that ask? Is there another way of doing it that isn't that? I, I'm trying to, because it wasn't, it was a panel member's request, and without checking the minutes there, that might not be here. I think the objective was to see how many interactions were had per case, essentially, like that, to see how much work there was in doing that, and that's, yeah, yeah, so, so based on that, are members happy to withdraw that recommendation? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, I can't do it. Thank you. So we'll do that. So that's, yeah, no, and, and thank you for your candor, to be fair, rather than dragging it out. So there we go. Great. Okay. Uh, any other questions on this item, on the um, digital strategy? No? Kit, thank you very much. So. Thank you, Chair. Can I make one comment just before I exit stage left? Um, I... Well, I'm not going to be here for this agenda item, but I just want to say how proud I am of the customer services team. You'll see the statistics. Um, it's not just that we've improved the statistics by quite such a radical amount across different channels. We've done it in a way that is humble, professional, 
timely. We've done it while providing MTF savings and while the residents who come through the door to see us are increasingly desperate. So I feel really emotional about this report and I really hope that you can see how much work has gone in to improving that. And just one last little point. We told this panel um, probably two years ago now that we were going to try and get telephony response average wait time under five minutes um, and we nailed it. So um, I just want to say that before I go because I'm really proud. No, thank you. And before you go, there are, who would be best to clear up some more dates possible inaccuracies in the tables. Yeah, so we can move on to the item, but I just wondered if you needed, but if you can cover that, Debbie, that's fantastic. Okay, then, we'll, thank you, Kit, much appreciated. We'll move on to item six, which is the customer services performance update to be presented by Debbie uh, over there. Um, so we'll go to Debbie first on that. I'm usually so loud I don't need one. <laughs> so we have had a really busy year in customer services. No such uh, thing as a quiet customer service year, but we've really, what I wanted to do this year, as we're coming out of COVID, was really focus on improving the performance and driving down those wait times. Um, we were anticipating, um, due to the cost of living, due to everything that's happened over the last two or three years, that we were going to face some challenges and that residents indeed were gonna face some challenges. And that's why I really wanted to drive those waiting times down so that we could support our residents better. We have got a strategy in place um, and we have uh, got our reorganisation which would support the strategy signed off in December. We had some delays with getting that signed off. There were some, um, we had to align some um, terms and conditions across the, the service and um, uh, also we had to provide substantial savings um, 1.3 million, um, which has resulted in us having fewer people to actually help us with the change. Um, but we are now moving forward. We've started to recruit the vacant posts within the reorganisation. We have the, the senior leadership team in place now, um, and we, we are moving forward, and we intend to continue building on this performance whilst increasing the channels that we can offer to our residents. And... Um, make it just really, it's, it's all about the residents and trying to make things better for them, whilst we're still supporting services in the back office as well, because it's frequent, we, we get frequent requests from services for support. We've recently had a request from our welfare rights team to support with the emergency support scheme, which we've trained some people up on that. As you know, we embraced the mobility team recent, well, a couple of years ago now, um, they came in and we improved that service and we have the telecare team as well supporting our residents as well. So it was, um, it's been a challenging year, but we are, as, as Kit said, we are really proud of, of the way that we've been able to, to drive these numbers down and improve things for our residents. So the date inaccuracy that I noticed was on the very first um, table and that is appendix A, page 38, where the top table table one is actually the performance this year and not last year as I've put there even though the dates the dates um, relate to last year and the um, table two relates to 22 was there any more date in well yeah just just clarity on that so the dates in the boxes we've got first of the fourth 23 to the end of 23 yeah and then last month we got that's last December so that's fine and last week we're there so it's this and last year essentially that one just to help me understand yeah so what I've done is in order to make it easier f for the panel um, I've, I've given you last year's performance from last year's report yeah. which is in this case table two um, against this year's so sorry, that you can see the improvement okay but last year that's 22 so that's two years sorry yes from last <laughs> that's year's what I'm, report, I'm so sorry yeah. prior year yeah, yeah. okay so th these dates are accurate basically on the left yes the yeah, dates perfect. are all Good. correct yes and that shows the amazing improvement i must say in things of a call abandonment etc there that's really good yeah. so yeah so that that makes tallies with what you're saying so that's fine that's good thank you for that um really good so you mentioned and i i think i've brought this up before that the channels that we use to communicate with residents so when you describe that do you mean like voice email all the different routes of getting support and have we have we developed any more thinking in the area of kind of chat and the ability to do that. So I see more and more kind of retail presences, customer services organizations 
resorting to like a chat service, you know, click here on the website to speak to an agent. So is there anything happening there? Yes, we have. That's, that's certainly on our plan this year. We want to bring in WhatsApp and chat. Um, and there's, there's lots of reasons why, um, why that's so important. And it's, it's so important because I use it myself. If I go onto a website and I'm trying to do something and the chat thing pops up, I might, I might go into that and use it. And it all, but what it does as well is it gives us more time to, to respond to, to residents who can't do that and residents who are in more need. And um, I don't know if any of you have been into the, to the service centre lately. Uh, people are getting increasingly more desperate and the more desperate people get, the more time we need to spend with them to try and help them. So any, any people who can self-serve, any people who are able to, to go online and to serve themselves, to use a chatbot where we can have one agent answering maybe three or four residents at the same time, it's just going to improve the performance for the rest of the customers and enable us to support the ones that really need us. That's really pleasing to hear, so thank you on that. Simon, I know you had some things prepared for this one, so would you like to <laughs> go for it, Councillor Pearce? Yeah, so uh, where was I? Um, so, yeah, f first of all, um, uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, you get to hear it twice, which is nice, but um, uh, very well done on, the, uh, on the, the improvements. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to to see where, you know, sort of, you know, from the call centre side of it, uh, the contact centre and then the emails where we've gone from 19 to kind of, you know, 19 days, which is extraordinary, right? to, to go to one day now. It's uh, very good, uh, very impressive and, and well done to, to you and the, and the team. Um, I had a question actually on table seven, the email handling performance. So with, with this average time to complete, just to clarify, is that the time for the issue to be resolved or to be to be connected to the correct department in order to for the for the for the issue to be resolved so in some cases that would be resolved so that would be if for instance a housing repair email comes in to us so that will be when we've re when we have um, raised the repair and responded to the client other times that is going to be where we have passed it on but generally speaking a lot of those a lot of that is where it's actually resolved and, and um, completed for the client. Um, so it's, um, as I say, around housing re repairs, which is the bulk of, of what we get. But we also, we can get queries about anything. You know, we could get a query that says, you know, what colour are the walls in the town hall? You know, th honestly, honestly, things like that. Um, or what, what floor polish do you use? Um, what's, what's your cleaning schedules? We get all, all sorts of inquiries. But generally speaking, that would be the time that we have actually responded to the customer and told them what's happening. It won't necessarily be when the repair or when the service has been provided, if that makes sense. So it could be um, somebody needs a parking permit, in which case a lot of the time, instead of going backwards and forwards with emails, we'll just phone the customer up show them, and talk them through how to do a parking permit online. Um, but where a repair is, we'll, we'll take that repair, we'll raise that repair, go back to the customer, say, your repair's been uh, raised, this is when, the, when it's going to happen, and this is the reference number. Could I just come in, Simon, on that, because it's related. So, um, we, so a lot of what you do is signposting, I guess, to you know, go here on the website, or we'll ring you up and show you how to do it. Do you record what I would describe as first contact closure? So, you know, they, they reach out to you, and you resolve their issue there and then, so, or... I guess it depends whether that issue has a lifespan for all the departments, right, to be able to be tracked, or does it go off into a different system and then it's lost to you in terms of visibility? So, so I would say whenever a customer comes to customer service, most of the time it's, it would be resolved there and then because resolved to us would be passing some information back to another department or completing a, a parking permit with somebody, raising a repair but it won't ever be, um, yes, that's completely done and dusted. And it's next to impossible for us to, for instance, if a customer raises a repair for a leaky tap, if the leak is containable, it could be 20, 30 days before that's repaired. For us to continually go and check and see if that's repaired will just take us away from our day job. So... When a customer comes through to us, most of the time we will deal with the query, um, but we don't have something that, that says blanket, yes, that's all done, first contact resolution. 
for some things it is council tax you know we'll be able to put on a um a single person discount um take in some student documents and that will be first contact resolution because we'll just do it there and then tenancy sign ups um requests for fobs and assers all of those things are our first contact resolution but where it's a service that's going to another department we couldn't possibly track that okay and and I suppose from a resident's perspective it's not resolved because it's been passed right to somewhere else so and i get that it's resolved because there is no further action for you but i wonder if we could would it be your aspiration that you know like with the council tax examples that you mentioned that you could solve more and more things is there areas you think that you could do more in terms of first contact resolution we always think we can do more with everything we always will it's it's frustrating as a customer service agent to have to pass things on to another department we would much rather do them so where i'm minded to go with that is if this panel were to make a recommendation to start monitoring first contact resolution and how we could drive that up would that be helpful and achievable, I suppose. <laughs> um, would I be able? Could you ask the question, and then I can come back because I can re, I can have a look at our CRM and see if there is any feasibility for us to be able to to close something down. So, for instance, um, what, uh, waste inquiries. We have a two-way integration with White Space. So, for instance, if a customer requests a bulky waste collection, that will um, uh, go, down, go down through our CRM into white space, they will deal with the query, that will come back and that will show us that that's actually closed down. Um, but that's the only two-way integration we have at the moment. It may be something that we can do as we get more integrations into other services. But, but you know, presumably if someone phones up at, with a council tax query and you resolve it for them there on the phone, that's still recorded and logged, right? So that would be a first contact resolution. So if we could start reporting on those, I think that would be good. And then it empowers you guys more to take more things to that first line, perhaps to help resolve the issues. So if it, perhaps again, if it's another, uh, to look at the feasibility of reporting first contact resolution. Yeah, I've got, I've got no problem with doing that. As long as, as, long as the council, uh, as long as the, uh, the panel can agree that I'll, I'll never be able to get it at 100%. No, no, I agree. But what yeah. I can do is I can get it, I can report on it for those services that we do, we do have that control over. Yeah, panel happy to, have them look at that. Yep, yeah, great. If we can take that one. Back to you, Simon. Sorry to come in on your. Yeah, no, I think, and I, just on that subject, I guess where we're talking about with the earlier, with the first report, where uh, the digital strategy is to move more into the um, those other areas, right? So that will that will you, the scope of your first contact will in, is is planned to increase, right? I guess in terms of things like housing repairs. Once you get housing repairs in integrated then you'll be able to monitor that. Is that sort of where you're planning to go with that? Absolutely. I have, um, so as I said, at the moment, we've got white space, which is a, a, full, a, a full integration. It goes out, it comes back. What we would love to have is that, that full integration with a housing repair service, because then, then you can see the, the job come in, the job go in to be scheduled and to be completed, and then to be completed and come back to us. And then we can, we can actually see that that's been done without having to look at um, three or four different systems to try and work it out. I had a query um, yesterday about a housing repair and it took me a, a good couple of hours by the time I'd spoken to several different people to find out exactly what had gone on because we had to go to so many different um, systems. I was listening to calls and it was, yeah, to have that, just that complete picture of it in front of you would be fantastic. Is it something, sorry, Chair, if you don't mind, just to pick on that. Is it is it something that your do your do your team have access to those systems, even as a reen only or something, or are they able to look at? Yeah, we've got access, so so we can raise repairs. So we can, um, if a customer phones up, but repairs are handled in two different ways. So if a customer phones up for a first repair, we will raise that in the contact centre or in the service centre, wherever the customer is, via email. We will raise that and we will schedule that job in what's called DRS, which is what schedules the, uh, the jobs into repairs so the operatives will go out. What we don't get is when that job's been done, we don't get it come back to us. Um, and 
So if we want to look at whether a job's been done, we have to go in. So we would always start with our CRM to find out when the customer rang up. We may even be able to listen to the calls. There's some calls that I can listen to and some that I can't. Um, and we would then have to go into um, the repairs system to see if the job's been done. But if it's on the same day, we might have to go into another system to see whether the operative has arrived there or not. And it can take a little while for the notes to be uploaded. So that's why I was sort of, you just have to follow the, the, the trail of breadcrumbs to find out exactly what's gone on. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's answered my question, thank you. Councillor Vandenbroek. Okay, listen to some of, the, I've, got, I've got two sort of sets of questions. Let's not, again, I'm more, I'm more qualitative than quantitative on some of this. I'm interested in, you're always sort of learning what to say to people, what's going on, how to do this. Do any of the departments learn from you? Do you sit around and go, that's the 15th question I've had about this today. Something's going wrong somewhere. How come they, they don't know um, how to get their parking permit or whatever? Is there, basically I'm asking, is the rest of the council learning from you? Uh, are there any channels for that? Um, every single day things like that happen. Uh, every single day we'll have a customer come in. Um, what I try to, to promote to the whole organisation is Whatever you do, whatever you do, customer service will get a call about it. So uh, there's um, uh, a colleague came up to us and said, oh, we're going to start phoning customers. And this, I was really glad about this. So it, it is actually a good example of what you've just asked me. A colleague came up and said, we're about to do a consultation with members of the public. We're going to start ringing them up, going out and speaking to them. Just want to let you know about it in case you get any calls so that you can verify it is somebody from the council. So, yes, the, the rest of the organisation is learning from us, especially um, because we do have quite uh, close ties with lots of departments, parking, housing repairs, um, housing inclusion, uh, lots and lots of different departments. It's not as good as it should be, but we are getting there. And that's, that's why some of the performance is improving, because as we're picking these things up, not only are we um, learning things within customer service, but we're also tweaking uh, processes and reviewing processes to make them a bit tighter, make it a bit more streamlined and linear. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And I'm just wondering what your influence is, because I think there should be some influence on getting the departments themselves to change their processes if they're not working. Because the people who know about that first is probably you lot. Yes, it is. <laughs> so one of the things that's in our strategy, actually, is to review and um, update the customer service standards. So this is one of the things that's really close to my heart is that however a customer contacts us, they should get the same service. So if they contact me in customer service and we answer the phone in under five minutes, which is, which is what we want to do, and I know that sounds like a long time, but it, it's actually not, and compared to how it used to be, at least it's realistic, is, 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 my, is my line. Um, but they could actually be ringing another department and be waiting a really long time to be answered or not answered at all. And the thing that we've learned out of improving our performance is that the calls do go down slightly because a lot of calls will be repeat calls. They will be, somebody's rung up, they haven't been answered, so they've abandoned the call, so they ring back. And then invariably what happens is that that person will ring or they'll contact one of you and they'll say, I was trying to get through to the, the contact centre for two hours, where essentially what they've done is they've rung up, put the phone down, rung again and gone to the back of the queue again. It's always better to hang on um, even if it's frustrating, there's always, we, we had terrible storms recently. We didn't meet um, our KPIs on those days. On a Monday morning, we had, at one stage, we had 60 calls for housing repairs waiting in the queue. Um, and even with 60 agents answering calls, that's going to be, well, it wasn't 60 minutes because we jumped in and started to offer callbacks to people. But... Um, it could have been up to 60 minutes wait, but we, we managed that down by just throwing everybody at it and saying, get people in numbers and we'll call them back, um, and which is what we did, where, where it wasn't an absolute emergency for those people. 
Okay, and sort of going on from this sort of approach of things, because I'm just trying to, basically I'm imagining myself at that call centre doing this job. And I'm wondering, do, do people feel, people, the operatives feel they've got all the tools and equipment and information they need to do the job? Are there areas where, I mean, I'm talking about the kind of recommendations we could make about what's missing to make things better? Sometimes it's, um, it's, sometimes it's getting through to our back offices can be a challenge. Um, and sometimes we find it a little bit frustrating when we know that we could help with something, but the service doesn't necessarily uh, agree. Um, so we, we, we found that a little bit uh, frustrating. And a good example of where we've helped with a service, actually, is if you look at page... Let me find it. I should have noted this. If you look at page 45... Um, in the in year 2022, the Housing Inclusion Service had 1,641 visitors um, to, to visit them. And we offered to triage those visitors so that um, they could concentrate on their, their day job. Um, and so we took nearly 1,000 people out of their queue just by triaging and supporting people. And that was, that took me a little while to, to, to convince them that we could do that because they were concerned that people would slip through the net, that they wouldn't get the information they wanted. So we just worked with them um, to, to try and improve that and make things better for them. Thanks, uh, Councillor Vandenbroek. Um, because we're near page 45, we'll go to page 44. So the, the fix my street numbers <laughs> like that. Do you want? To? <laughs> so I mean, abandoned vehicles. That's pretty. Um, what, what, where these percentages are low, because there's some excellent percentages here. And from my casework experience, this tells true. You know, street sweeping is generally excellent. You know, when issues are reported. So do the issues tend to lie in the services picking up the work when it's allocated to them? How, how is that managed? And, because the percentage is very low doesn't mean the work hasn't been done. It just means they're not closing the job. Right, okay. So it's potentially a training issue, to put it politely, in terms of how they interact with Fix My Street? Maybe, yes. Okay. So, so services being better educated in how to interact with Fix My Street. Is it a Fix My Street job they have to close, or is it an internal job that's then raised off the back of this? As this is a Fix My Street job. Right, so okay. This is, this so is, um, this is a... As I say, I could, I could easily um, get my team who, who, who manage this to go in and automatically close everything because um, some things do automatically close. Um, for instance, the dog fouling automatically closes because that's, that's dealt with under street sweeping. So the, when the streets are sweep, swept, that's, that's automatically closed. Um, and the litter bins. Um, but... As you know, we had a query, we had an inquiry about Fix My Street um, and about a complaint. And so Fix My Street is a little bit of an anomaly because it does strange things. So, for instance, that complaint was about some plasterboard being left in the street. That's the one, isn't it? It was left in Wellhall Road. Um, so, and the resident wouldn't know any different. The resident reported that as a fly tip, as I would. I would report that as a fly tip. Um, no, it's not a fly tip, it's street sweeping. So because, so that then what happened was, and we are looking into this to fix this, what happened was the job went to fly tip where it was automatically closed um, because they don't do that. But we need to find a way of making them just refer that back. So some, yes, some of it's training um, and I'll see what I can do for next year. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, but but it, it is possible to pass it. It's not a limitation of the platform. It's a, it's a training issue. Uh, no, it, apparently you can't pass it back, but my developer is looking at that to see if there's a way that he can do it. Okay, fair enough. So we'll keep that under advisement and, and watch these numbers, I guess, from there. That's great. Um, I, I had one around um, CSAT, so customer satisfaction. And it's do we do any of that random... Kind of polling, so you know, a quick survey at the end of the call. How did you find it? That sort of thing. That's coming. It should be here. It should have been here now. 
um, but we had to get a new server um, and that's the only reason it isn't. So I would imagine that will be in place by April, if not before. Okay, great. I'd, I'd like to back that up with a recommendation that we do it, just in case it slips. So if we, if we could just, do, are you happy with terming it a CSAT? Is that a, a good term for you? Yeah. I'm really happy for you to make the recommendation as well. Yeah, so we can do that one. So to, to collect CSAT scores, or, I, I guess you're going to do it randomly, not on every call, or kind of as a, I suppose, assess it? Every call will get the opportunity. Um, it'll only be if the, if the customer does it. Yeah, of course. So we, want, yeah. we want to put it on every call to get as much as possible. Fine, yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's it for my questions. Were there any actions from last time? Yes, so we, we recommended last time to publish a list of realistic SLAs to help manage residents' expectations. The response on that is um, that we've exceeded the proposed SAS, SLA levels, which is great news. I'm not sure whether we've... Are they in here, the SLA levels? Have I missed them? I think um, Kit responded to that one. I think she's referring to the performance because the performance has improved so much. I couldn't do the, um, the SLAs because I haven't yet done the customer service standards, so I didn't really have anything to measure them against. And in order to get the customer service standards ratified, I will have to speak to um, every department that deals with customers and get them to agree to the standards that I'm proposing. I do have a set of standards that I'm proposing, um, and I needed to get the, uh, the strategy signed off and then the reorganisation in place to be able to do that. So I think one of the specific asks, uh, sorry, the intent of the ask around this one last year, if I recall, was that residents could see how long they'd expect, be expected to wait to establish contact. So maybe not to have resolution, as we've talked about. So we've got average wait times here. That's great. So I think the intent with this was to almost put it on the website and say, look, if you do call us, you could expect to wait around this time. These are our busy periods, etc. Have we done anything like that? That's certain, that's part, that forms part of the strategy, and that forms part, we've got a data section in the strategy. So we have all of that information. I have all of that, you can see I have that information in front of me. I could get that information for you. You know, I could get you up to date information. It's how I publish that on the website. So because they're doing so much work on the website at the moment, I'm hoping that this will form part of that and we'll be able to even just have a banner saying, you know, current wait times in customer service or please phone us on Thursday afternoons, it's far less busy, which it is. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff. And it, it, it goes along with those realistic um, customer service standards that I, that I want to bring in. So perhaps to, to refresh that recommendation and be more specific, publishing of kind of wait times or expected wait times on the website would be a useful recommendation yeah. to drive it forward at the same time. Happy with that, panel? Yep. So we'll add that one in. Thank you, Deb. So I think that's... Oh, and automated callbacks was the other one. So great that we've got the free phone number for housing repairs. I think that's helped a lot of people. Um, so really it was just exploring the automated callbacks. Is there any further development on that? Okay. No, there isn't. But um, we, I will explore it. I am, it does give me a slight concern because it can seriously impact performance and there's nothing worse than promising someone a callback and they don't get it. At the moment, if we promise someone a callback, we know that we're able to fulfil that and we know that we're able to call them back and we'll even be able to give them a rough time that we'll do so. Unfortunately, if we do automate, automated callbacks, the callbacks will come into the service centre when there's space. If there's no space, we haven't got any control. So. I'm, I'm happy to have a look at it, but I'm concerned that it would seriously impact our performance. Yeah, I guess the risk is you end up almost with a dedicated callback team, not on the front line dealing with things like that, and someone's issue may have resolved itself by the time they got a callback, and that's a waste of time. But, if it, but it's still outstanding, the action, so I, I don't propose changing that at the moment, and we just explore it and, and come up with a rationale. As you say, there's the inverse problem where people hang up, try ring again, go to the back of the queue, and you're stacking the queue that way and great generating dissatisfaction. So I think it would be good to see what the balance is and how we achieve that. Um, that's all my questions on this item. I don't know if members have any more. No? Okay. Debbie, thank you so much. Always great to see you. And thank you for the work you do dealing with residents on the front line because uh, I'm sure you get good and bad a lot of the time coming. So.
We shall move on to item seven, which is the commissioning of future reports. Are members happy to note the work program, which I don't think has changed radically since last time, but we can have a quick look at that. Yes, Simon. Yeah, just, just a question on that, Chair. So um, I'm just wondering when we're gonna get street enforcement back, because we, uh, we were waiting for them, weren't we, last time, so. Yes, as you say, so that's what postponed the November meeting, or the December meeting, I believe, and um, I am actively working on that. So I have a meeting with officers next week to uh, pursue that. There are still some concerns about the content of the report that just need to be ironed out, but it's, I assure you it's in flight. My proposal is to, essentially being as we postpone that session is to move it to a new one. I think it is worthy of a, a dedicated session as we felt before. So I think we just do that rather than tag it on to a, another session and compromise the quality of the time that we'll get to analyze that one. So rest assured it's being worked on, um, but there are uh, so, some machinations that need to be gone through first, I think, to get there. So. That said, are members happy to uh, note that item seven? Yep, great stuff. In which case, that brings the meeting to a close. So thank you for all your time and uh, have a good evening.